All righty, it is uh, 3 p.m. I uh, hope everybody's having a good day so far. Um, seeing lots of cool tech, particularly in the uh, open source and IoT space. Um, some housekeeping notes, when we get to the end, um, I'm gonna hopefully have time for some questions. Um, if you lob me a good one, uh, meatballs please. Um, I've got some freebies, uh, if you're interested, so. Um, Welcome to uh, Building Modular IoT Gateways with Open Source Technologies. Um, hopefully the talk title leads you to believe that this will be a bit of a high level conversation, um, and it will. We'll talk a little bit of architecture. Um, in particular, we're gonna, we are gonna dig down a little bit though onto the Microsoft Azure IoT Gateway SDK. So we're gonna talk about how the SDK can be used um, in you know, sort of on-prem installations to help funnel data to the cloud. And then uh, time permitting, we'll get into some demo and actually see some code fly. Um, because that's, I know, why most people are here is to actually see uh, demos explode and speakers look ridiculous uh, in front of their audiences. So, uh, without further ado, my name is William Berry. Most people call me Bill. Um, I'm a senior software developer for Microsoft in the developer experience team. So, uh, most of the people in my group are evangelists. Um, I happen to be a software developer by trade, and that's what I do day in and day out. Um, the group that I work for has a really sort of cool mission, right? We take new and emerging technologies that Microsoft is producing and working on. We find partners that are out in the real world, in industry, and we embed with them to help them build their products and services for their end customers. What that does is that helps us, Microsoft, learn how to use and frankly abuse our own products, right? And, you know, feedback to our engineering teams about how things are going, um, and also does a little bit of evangelism work where we get to see our products sort of spread out into the community. And this is particularly important in the open source world um, and in the IoT space since, you know, we're talking about everything from devices that are on-prem within constrained networks all the way up to cloud data workloads, you know, post-processing, machine learning, and so on and so forth. And, and we as IoT experts have sort of that, you know, that great opportunity to see the stack, the full system end to end. Um, and uh, yeah, anyhow, so without further ado, uh, just kind of curious, little audience catching question. Uh, do I have any makers in the audience? People that like, you know, build their own chips, do their own work at home, maybe some 3D printing? Yes, no, maybe. This was the audience participation part, so you can raise your hands enthusiastically um, in support of, okay, all right. So how about those of us that are in the consumer space, right? So refrigerators, devices in the home, maybe home automation stuff and manufacturing around that space. Okay, a few people. And industry, manufacturing, right? Uh, automotive, aeronautics, uh, anything along those lines? All right, everybody working with embedded devices? All right, cool. Uh, so, without further ado, um, my background is not in software, okay? My background is actually in live entertainment. So I worked in the theater industry for years. Um, I worked on Broadway for a scene shop that uh, put together most of the shows that you see on Broadway and that tour around the world, okay? My specialty was automation and motion control. So we took the same sort of technology that you know, BIC uses to make a thousand razors a second, and we made really large pieces of machinery move around the stage, right, for actors, scene changes, flying stuff. Um, and that industry has some very, very hard constraints, okay? One, we're typically dealing with large machinery. We're typically dealing with life safety you know, sort of scenarios, right? Because there are people around our moving machinery. Um, we've got machinery that's interacting with other pieces of machinery, right? So safety equipment, pin releases and that kind of stuff for lifts that are in the stage, elevators that are backstage, you know, flying pieces of scenery that come in and land on stage. Um, and above and beyond that, we deal with a ton of telemetry data. So these systems that we're building, right, that are moving from theater to theater to theater, right, all across the world, right, have some incredibly hard constraints. And, and in these environments, we're deploying things like PLCs, okay, standard programmable logic controllers. We're deploying things like hydraulic controllers. 
We're deploying regular Windows machines for human-machine interface, maybe some touch screens, right? So we've got this broad base of hardware that we've installed into these spaces, right? And they all generate data, lots and lots and lots of data. Unfortunately, most of that data is trapped in the theater, right? We can't get it out for any, any number of reasons, not the least of which is that you typically don't control the internet access within the building that you're moving into. Most of the venues keep that stuff locked down. The only thing they want you doing is checking your email, right? So you have this opportunity where, you know, if you could cloud enable your installations, you could begin to collect more telemetry data, right? You could begin to collect information about how your machines are operating, how the operators are operating those machines, right? What are the performance characteristics, right? Standard predictive, you know, uh, maintenance and monitoring, you know, remote monitoring. Those things become, you know, accessible as soon as we can sort of cloud enable our applications, right? Cloud enable our devices. Um, but we also have, you know, serious security risks, right? We don't want this hardware to be sitting out on the open internet, right? VPNs, eh, they're secure, but they have their drawbacks. Um, you know, so anyhow, uh, in this particular, you know, sort of environment, right, we've got lots and lots and lots of different types of machinery that are moving, lots of different types of microprocessors and computers that are operating. Um, and we were in sort of the world of the classic big data space, okay? Does everybody know about the, um, yes, the three V's, volume, velocity, and variety? Anybody ever heard about this for big data? Yes, no, yes, I see some nods, good, nods. Audience participation, you can, you can nod and, and uh, uh, make me feel more comfortable up here. So in our particular applications in live entertainment, right, we were dealing with a lot of data, right, a high volume of data. We've got microprocessors that are cycling every 5, 10, 15, 50 milliseconds, right? They're reading their entire input space, they're executing some amount of logic, and then they're writing to their output space kicking over and running that same process again. So we've got the opportunity to collect a ton of data from the field, right, and use that data for, for processing down the roads. Additionally, right, and, and I'll speak to at least one show that I did that toured from Chicago to Toronto, I think ultimately Boston, um, we had high velocity data, right? So this show traveled with about 75 axes of automation, okay? So any particular wagon, piece of flying scenery, lift in the floor, right? One dimension of motion for us is an axis of automation, right? And we had 75 of them. We were flying a piece of truss over the stage that weighed 75,000 pounds, okay? It had 30 pieces of scenery flying up in it, right? With literally 60 plus motors, you know, hanging the thing from the sky. It was huge, right? And there were times when nearly everything on that stage was moving at the same time, right? So we have all of this telemetry building up really quickly, executing for, you know, 5, 10, 15 seconds, and then going quiet, right? So what this is is like high-velocity data, right? We have nothing for a long period of time. Then we shoot a lot of telemetry up, right? Everything's in motion, and then we calm back down as we decelerate, and everything sort of changes into the next scene. And the last point here is that we've got variety in our data, right? Because we're reading from PLCs, from, uh, you know, drives from Mitsubishi and PLCs from Beckhoff, uh, you know, hydraulic controllers and Opto22 stuff uh, for console integration. So we've got a wide variety of different information that can be aggregated together um, through some sort of application, which brings me to my next point. For us, we, you know, we had all these things deployed out into the field, and you know, this was a while ago before the cloud was popular, and if we had the opportunity to send stuff to the cloud, right, we've got this giant air gap, right, a high impedance air gap between these two spaces, right? Restricted on-premises data, where we would like that data, so that when things go wrong, we don't have to fly somebody to Korea, which happened to me on more than one occasion. Um, that is a long trip, by the way, particularly from New York. Um, and we've got this sort of, this air gap between these two. We've got a connectivity problem, right? We could potentially just take each one of these endpoints, you know, in the right situation, in the right scenario, and just pump their data raw to the cloud, okay? And in the Azure space, right, we do have that capability, 
right? We have a thing called a protocol gateway that allows you to deploy custom written software as a gateway on the cloud side meaning that each individual device that you have can then talk to the cloud via whatever protocol that, I'm gonna keep running into that, via whatever protocol that it wants to talk, and then you can sort of normalize that information once you get to the cloud side. But for us, we were in a constrained space, right? We were dealing with networks that we didn't own, that we weren't gonna be operating over. So what we needed was something that was gonna sit sort of on the on-premise side that was gonna give us the capability to aggregate this information together, to collect it, to filter it, to do some sort of pre-processing before we ship that data off-site. Which brings us to gateways. Um, that is my daughter, by the way, um, checking to see if there was a gnome that was there. My other daughter in this photo actually was stealing the gnomes that were there, which is a totally different problem. <laughs> um, but this is a classic example of a gateway, right? There is something on the, you know, something, some maybe piece of information that's on the other side of that door. We open the door, we get access to that information. And that's what our gateway applications are allowing us to do. So fundamentally, at a, at a high level, the things that we're, you know, the topics that we want to cover um, when we're discussing gateways are security and isolation. Right? So we want to have security sort of in the forefront of our conversations. Right? Are we partitioning our networks? Right? Are we constraining access to our protected networks in both directions? Um, you know, are we making sure that we've got solid isolation in those networks, that we don't have open vulnerabilities that we're not expecting? The other opportunity for gateways is around integration. Right? Can we reach out to lots of different devices. You know, in, in like I said, my last job in live, live entertainment space, you know, we were deploying Beckhoff gear that was talking Modbus over TCP. You know, we had a little bit of TwinCat for some of their high, you know, their high speed bus applications. There was CAN bus that was out there. Um, you know, and all of, you know, all these different industrial automation protocols that we had deployed, leveraging a gateway we can work each one of those channels independently and aggregate that information together. And we'll look how that's accomplished a little later. One other opportunity we have is that if we're gonna put some smart compute out into the field, let's do some work there, right? Let's not let that machine sit idle, right? We have an opportunity to do pre-processing, to do edge computing, to do edge analytics on this data before we ship it to the cloud. So let's get a platform together, a place where we can perform some of those activities. Um, lastly, batching and compression, right? Uh, this isn't necessarily as true as it used to be, but uh, data pipelines are expensive, right? Wiring stuff up to public infrastructure is not cheap. You know, T1 lines are expensive, gigabit lines are expensive. You know, connecting yourself to the internet is not a cheap thing, particularly if you're in remote communities doing manufacturing, you know, doing uh, electrical system integrations and that kind of stuff. We want to be cognizant of the amount of bandwidth that we're consuming. So we also have an opportunity with our gateways to do batching and compression, where we collect a bunch of messages together, we compress that data, and then we burst that data up to the cloud where we can use it later on. So. Where do our gateways go? This is sort of our stock Azure IoT reference architecture. You can pretty much ignore everything that's over here. I have lots of friends from Microsoft that will be talking about data processing in the cloud, about what you can do with your IoT data once it's up in the cloud, where you can put it, uh, you know, how you can store it, and those sorts of things. What I want to focus on is the stuff over here. right? We've got IP-capable devices you know, that can connect themselves directly to the cloud, and that could be using something like the protocol gateway that I was speaking of earlier. Conversely, we might have a fleet of existing IoT devices, you know, on-prem microcontrollers and PLCs and those types of devices that are sitting on a plant floor, sitting, you know, maybe you've got a, a, you know, some sort of Bluetooth device in a retail location, that kind of thing. We have an opportunity to collect those you know, those pieces of information use those devices and send their data up to the cloud. And how we're going to do that is by dropping a field gateway. That field gateway is going to act as a client to the cloud. Okay? It's going to have an SDK on it. It's going to have some client that's going to allow it to send data to a cloud. Um, could be any cloud. I would hope that that's Azure, but it could fundamentally be any cloud. Um, so in this case, we're going to take our re resource constrained devices, right, our Bluetooth, our co-app, 
devices. We're going to build a protocol system that we can deploy to our field gateway that will allow us to read information from those devices and then do post-processing. So in this particular case, the gateways that we're talking, we're going to be you know, continuing to talk about and look at are going to be things that we're going to deploy you know, to some locality, some place near the devices, the sensors, the things that we want to interoperate with. Okay? So, continuing on. Microsoft provides the Azure IoT Gateway SDK. Okay? This is a library that gives you a little bit of application and it gives you a little bit of infrastructure. Okay? One of the cool things about it is that it is open source. Um, you know, and that can't sort of be understated, uh, well, or overstated, excuse me, that can't be overstated enough. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we do, we can help put our risk out into the community by sharing our knowledge, right? We can collaborate together in the open, we can participate in open conversations, and we can shape the software that many people use, right? And part of that is helping de-risk our applications, right? When we go to build something, we can do it with great speed, right? But we're also going to bake in all of our assumptions about the environments that we're operating in. And there may be things that are outside of our scope of focus that we can't catch. So leveraging open source software gives us the ability to sort of in the, you know, in the open aggregate all of our different viewpoints together, right, to build a better, more solid product. And in this particular case, you know, we're offering a, a gateway SDK that is open source. And above and beyond that, right, it's cross-platform, right? So everybody's working in the Linux space, yes? Windows open source people. There we go. I got one guy in the back. Okay, the demo's just for you. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to do a Linux demo today because I work at Microsoft. And... Um, yeah, somewhere on here I have a sticker that says Microsoft loves Linux, and it's true, we actually do. Um, almost everybody on my hall uh, up in Redmond, we actually do a lot of open source work. Um, so the guy that sits in the chair right behind me does Kubernetes work, right, and integrating Kubernetes and cluster management uh, with Azure uh, resources. So we do honestly love Linux. Um, we're talking about being able to deploy to lots of different types of hardware, right? Um, we can do, you know, Raspberry Pis, Intel NUX, you know, all the way up to full-on regular server-style machines. Um, also, we're standards compliant, right? We're written in ANSI C, C99. Um, one of the cooler things that we'll talk about in the next slide is that we also support other languages, too. So the fundamental architecture behind the SDK is that we're going to you know, we've got this sort of baseline message broker where we're going to send all of our data, all of our messages. We're going we're to hoist our workload onto that message broker, just like you would with something like AMQP or Rabbit or MQTT. We're going to put all of our messages onto a broker and then tell that broker how to move our data around the system for us. Okay? The architecture itself <coughs> excuse me, is uh, highly customizable and pluggable. So we can build new modules, insert them into the sort of data pipeline, and augment you know, the behavior of our gateway system. Right? And that's particularly important in sort of you know, an agile development environment where we may not understand the final business requirements of the system that we're building. Right? Like we may want to start prototyping and be able to iterate on that, you know, that development work over and over and over again, adding features and adding functionality into the system without having to dramatically change its structure. So the way we can do that is to isolate our processes, you know, our business logic, into self-contained modules, deploy those modules to the gateway, and then wire them into the data flow um, of the gateway. We support multiple language bindings. So aside from being able to develop in C, we also support Java. We support uh, .NET uh, and Node, so JavaScript with Node. And we have bindings for all three environments. And you can mix and match, which is really quite an interesting story. 
Um, particularly for me, I'm primarily a .NET developer, and even weirder, I'm primarily a functional programmer. So I like to write my code in F Sharp, um, and either cross compile to JavaScript to deploy to Node, or actually deploy through the CLR um, directly from my F Sharp code. Um, so this is a great opportunity for me to continue to add to module development and that kind of stuff, even though I'm not primarily a C developer. Um, with the gateway, and we'll, talk, we'll touch a little bit more on this later, we deploy a handful of modules sort of out of the box that give you some really great functionality to help you do things like connect to the cloud. So we have an IoT hub module. An IoT hub is our pass service that's designed to help you connect literally millions of devices up to Azure, right? So it's a huge ingestion system. We layer on top of that ability to ingest data device management capabilities. So we can register devices and deregister devices. We can push firmware updates from the cloud. We can interoperate with devices that are on premises from the cloud using things like direct messages. And we can push configuration data back and forth between our on-prem devices and the cloud using things like device twins. Um, lastly, and I touched a bit on this earlier, you know, the, the, our gateway provides the ability to do buffering and batching um, sort of out of the box. So in, you know, low constant connectivity scenarios, places where the internet access is going in and out, the SDK will help buffer those messages and keep them basically cycling around so that eventually when connectivity comes back and the connection stands back up, it will send all of that data up to the cloud. Additionally, it has batching out of the gate that you can, t you can turn on to do message aggregation and help you know, sort of constrain your internet data consumption. Um, above and beyond that, we'll talk about other techniques you can use around batching and compression uh, by building modules later on. So let's talk about some concepts. <coughs> Excuse me. In this particular case, we're going to look at connecting a legacy device up to the cloud, right? We've got something like, in this particular photo here, um, for those of you that care, this was my thesis project. Um, I did a robotic bed for a production of West Side Story. And if you're going, why was there a robotic bed in West Side Story? That's a great question, and I don't honestly have a good answer for you, but there was. In this particular case, we were using a uh, Beckhoff Modbus TCP IP controller basically to interoperate with this remote device. And it was using just regular wireless, off-the-shelf hardware uh, to do connectivity, basically a bridge between two points between our controlling machine and the remote device. So if we were to shift this to a cloud scenario, we've got our, you know, our Beckhoff controller. And we're going to do a custom module around you know, Modbus implement, you know, some Modbus implementation. Could be serial. Probably TCP IP in this case, since it's 2017. Um, and I don't know how many serial networks are left around. Um, but we're going to do some sort of protocol ingestion. And then we're going to pipe our data over to a module that's going to send the information up to the cloud. Okay? That's going to be that IoT hub module, more than likely, that's going to help us basically receive messages from the, the broker that I was talking about earlier and fire that data up to IoT hub and to our Azure subscription. So here is the actual gateway architecture, what you would build if you were to deploy the gateway SDK uh, to you know, your, uh, your installation. So we've got our remote device. It's talking whatever protocol you want. Co-app, BACnet, Modbus, OPC UA, the list goes on. We're going to have some sort of ingestion module, and that thing is going to be responsible to talking to our remote device. It's going to publish messages, content, to the broker. Those messages can have properties, things that you, you know, sort of metadata that you attach to the message that's going to allow you to do sort of filtering and post-processing down the road. We're going to maybe deploy another module, you know, something that's going to do data filtering. Let's say we're, we're, we're in a situation where we've got lots and lots and lots of telemetry data that's being generated, right? A temperature sensor. And we're going to read that temperature sensor every 10 milliseconds or every 100 milliseconds. Well, more than likely, our error threshold isn't actually all that high, and we're really concerned about coarse grain temperature movements. So most of our measurements will be exactly the same. So in the filtering step, we've got the ability to capture something like our deltas, right? Meaningful, measure, you know, measurable change in, say, our temperature sensor reading. And then we propagate the data past there, you know, only when the data is meaningful. 
We have modules around identity mapping that will allow you to map sort of a, a MAC address of a you know, network device that is in your field, you know, your field deployment uh, to a logical device address that's attached to the cloud. And that way we can you know, basically create a pipeline of data from you know, device all the way up to the cloud and be talking about the same consistent thing from the perspective of the gateway. We've got logging modules baked in so that you can flood data down to local log files, particularly maybe around the behavior of your modules or error conditions, you know, notifications and that kind of stuff. We can be writing that down to local files. And then the last step here would be something like our IoT Hub module where you're going to be pumping that data up to the cloud. And again, at each one of these steps, you'll notice we've got properties for our messages as well as the content. So you've got the ability to listen to a message stream, right? Pipe, you know, plug modules together, and then you have the opportunity to filter those messages within each module based on metadata about that message. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how do you get started? Um, your basic workflow will look like this. You'll have some amount of business logic that you'll want to implement that is specific to your domain. You will write modules that encapsulate that business logic you know, as a single unit of deployment. Okay? From there, all of our configuration is done via a single JSON file for the Gateway SDK. So you'll add a definition around your module, what arguments it takes from sort of the environment. So if you have runtime or operational specific characteristics you want to apply to your module, you can do that through the configuration file. And then at the end of the configuration file, we'll actually wire up all of our modules to create our data pipeline. So ingestion, to filtering, to identity mapping, right, to logging, and then off to IoT Hub for our cloud ingestion. And the last step will be deploying. So as I mentioned before, what's, you know, what's in the box? What are we shipping right now? Well, we're shipping a logger that'll help you do local file logging. Uh, we're shipping the IoT Hub module that allows us to interoperate with IoT Hub, our PaaS service in Azure. Uh, we have a Bluetooth, 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 Bluetooth low energy module um, that allow you to do uh, some quick start setups, particularly in the Bluetooth space. So um, one thing I can suggest is if you look, uh, Texas Interest Texas Instruments makes this really cool little sensor tag that's got a bunch of little uh, different sensors on it, you know, temperature, humidity, velocity, that kind of stuff. Um, and that thing talks via Bluetooth LE. It's relatively inexpensive and is a great way to sort of demo and try out these workflows uh, for yourself. Um, we have the identity module, which like I said, helps us map, you know, some sort of on-premise identifier up to our cloud device identity. And then we've got a bunch of community added modules. And this is the part, you know, part of the open source conversation here is that, you know, we are looking to try to build a community around modules and functionality that people can just pull off the shelf and use within their data pipelines. So places where that's relatively interesting, OPC UA, we have a module for it right now. Um, Modbus, uh, which is an, you know, an open protocol in the industrial automation space as well. Um, BACnet, uh, I'm actually kicking off a project relatively soon to do co-app integration for low power devices, which would be, I think, a relatively interesting build. Um, and I've also published stuff around uh, compression, using gzip compression in your data pipelines. And then we've got some additional modules coming around batching. So uh, we are looking for you know, community help to build out sort of this ecosystem so that we have the opportunity to pull down you know, gateways, pull down modules, and kick things off the ground relatively quickly. So these modules can be kept all configured through JSON, like all of them? Okay, so the question was, uh, all of these modules can be configured through JSON? Yes, they can. So, and in fact, that is how you will configure them, is using a JSON file, which we will see in just a moment. And by just a moment, I mean now, demo time. So, let's minimize this. Let's minimize that. Okay, let's go to display. We're gonna do a little, uh, maybe a little duplicate display. Are we gonna do that? There we go. Okay, so if I told you that I had my slides still up, would you believe me? The answer should be yes. 
Um, if I told you that I could run, <laughs> it didn't do it, did it? Extend these displays, duplicate these displays, apply, keep these changes. All right, let's see if you're going to stay there. Okay, so what do I have here? Anybody recognize this desktop? Somebody Ubuntu? Yes, good. So I am running Ubuntu inside of a VM in Hyper-V on my Windows machine because I'm cool like that. And I have a super secret password. There we go. So the Gateway SDK um, basically looks like this when you clone it. You're going to have things like bindings, um, dependencies, some core information, some docs, some dependencies, modules, samples, tools, etc. The build for this is all done in CMake, and the instructions are actually really good on the website, and we'll kind of look them over towards the end. Um, but let's drill into our samples real quick, just so we can look at, oh, I already have it up. Awesome. So this is what the gateway configuration looks like. At the top, can everybody, oh, you can't read that, can we? Let's do this. <laughs> it's probably not even going to be showable. All right, here, I'm going to flip back to Visual Studio Code, and hopefully we can make this a little bit bigger for you. Okay, there we go. Let's do that. Okay, so this is the same configuration file. It happens to be a Windows version um, to the parity one that is for Linux. So at the top of our configuration file, like you were asking, we're going to define loaders. And these are the things that are going to define those extra runtime bindings for Java, Node, .NET. So we're going to say where we're going to get our binding from, any configuration parameters for that binding, its type and the name. Um, continuing on, we're going to define the modules that we want to have loaded. So in this particular case, we're going to load up a module called Node Printer. Its loader name is Node, which is going to be mapped to that loader array that we saw above. And we're going to give it an entry point that's going to give it a path, basically, to the JavaScript file that we want executed as part of this data pipeline. And we can keep adding, basically, um, keep adding different modules <coughs> to the JSON file, you know, to that array, specifying all the functionality that we want. You know, in this particular case, let's see, that was the writer. What's a good one here? Here, so here's our IoT Hub writer. So this is the thing that's going to be responsible for taking our, you know, sort of the end of the pipeline of our message broker in the Gateway SDK and shuffling that information up to IoT Hub for us. You can see in, in args, in this args object, we've got a connection string element. And here I've got the connection string for my particular device um, to wire that, <clears throat> excuse me, to wire the gateway up to Azure IoT Hub. At the very end of this file, you'll notice a section called links. And what this is going to do is this is telling the gateway how to plumb all of our different modules together. So in this particular case, I'm going to define a source that could be every single module. So that's what the star stands for. And I'm going to sync down to the logger. What that means is that everything that the, you know, each module, all the data that the module produces that it writes out is going to go down to the logger for processing. Our next one, our node sensor, we're going to wire that up to the IoT Hub writer. Right? So we're going to take our basically a si simulated piece of, uh, of or code that runs as a simulator, create some fake data, and push that data up to IoT Hub. And additionally, we'll print that out to the console when we actually go to run this. So this is what your JSON file looks like. And it really is not all that complicated. Um, <clears throat> you know, because it's JSON, we've got the ability to also script and automate this. So if you're thinking like, you know, I've got multiple different runtime environments that need different modules deployed. It is relatively simple to script the creation of this file based on different parameters. In fact, I've got a really kind of cool blog post about how to do that with PowerShell um, to just define up a series of inputs, and then it will build this entire file as part of the deployment and build pipeline for you. Um, so that whole thing is, uh, aut you know, can be automated. Let's see, let's flip back. Okay, so we're back in our installation, um, and let me minimize this. Let's actually run this thing. So, <coughs> excuse me, the build process for this, uh, at least this particular demo, because I'm using Node, is two-step. One, we need to build some bindings, 
right, that will tell our gateway SDK how to interoperate with the node scripts that we're going to run. Okay, and that obviously means building a node environment. So we're going to start by building our bindings, and then we're going to basically build the SDK with those bindings enabled, and and you know tell the SDK build scripts, look, go ahead and enable all these bindings, and and it'll point to those those particular artifacts for integration. Now that process does take a while. It is um, it is not short. You know, the, the build process for the node bindings is probably 20 minutes, and it's another 10 minutes for the SDK to build. Um, it's C, that's kind of the way life is. <coughs> Excuse me. My apologies. Um, so, let's see. Let's go up to run this, if I can find my command that I had so neatly typed in before. Of course, I'm not going to be able to find it. Nope. All right. I'll do this from scratch. Dot slash node. Let's see. CD dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash. Uh, CD build. CD node. Uh, samples. Node. Dot last. CD node. Oh, it's right there. Sorry, dot slash node simple sample, and then let's do dot dot slash slash samples uh, node source gateway Linux. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to call into the SO that I created. Wow, that is really small. Um, how do I how do I increase the font size on this? Yeah, it's not, it's not giving me the love. Yeah, let's, let's hope it's there. Oh, there we go. Oh, control plus plus. There we go, okay. So here, uh, we're gonna go ahead and build, um, we're gonna execute our SO file that we've generated from the build, and we're gonna pass it that gateway uh, sample code, <coughs> excuse me, um, that we were working on earlier. And right now what is basically happening is we're generating fake data, that data is being printed to the screen, and we're also streaming that live up to uh, Azure. And we will prove that that's the case by going here, and this is my Azure subscription where I have, um, my IoT hub configured, and if everything goes well, it will show more than the seven that were there before. Give this a second to load. Round of applause if this has worked, please. Um, somebody want to do the Jeopardy theme song while this loads? Do, 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 do. Oh, and it still says seven. <laughs> How pleasant. So let's do activity log, operations and monitoring. It's fine, over here. Add that to the dashboard. All right, well, it uh, certainly should have sent those messages up, but does not appear to be showing yet in the, uh, in the dashboard. This can occasionally take a little while for the telemetry data to show up on the home screen. Um, we'll try the diagnostics information here in a second. All right. There we go. 29 messages. Look at that. A round of applause for IoT Hub being kind of slow to display that data. Um, Anyhow, so basically we've, what we've done here is we've you know, built a set of language bindings, right? We've built the SDK, we've deployed our modules through configuration with our JSON file, and we kicked that thing off and let it run. And you know, 
That's basically the story. It is relatively fast to get started here, um, particularly if you're looking to do sort of integration environments where you need to read from a lot of different types of sensor data. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, let's see. Getting... Kick this over. Resources. Okay, this is the location of the Gateway SDK. It's github.com slash Azure slash Azure IoT Gateway SDK. Our API reference <coughs> is available on a GitHub IO page attached to the same repository. Um, our built-in modules are listed out sort of uh, at this URL. They're also on the home page, which I'll show up in just a second. And then our featured modules are a, uh, just a deep link off the main page. So the question to you is, can you go out and build something on the gateway? And if so, can you help us by contributing to the ecosystem? That's my, my, one, my one plea to you, um, is to help us build an ecosystem around gateway applications for IoT. Um, I think there's a lot of potential here, uh, way more potential than I think we've, we've even begun to, to really think about. Um, in particular around the edge compute space, right? If we're gonna deploy something like a gateway, we have the opportunity to actually deploy some real hardware out into the field. And now all of a sudden, you know, not just edge analytics becomes sort of within scope, but actual edge compute becomes within scope, right? We can do intelligent decision making, right? Relay information to the cloud, potentially close some stopgap with local code execution while we wait for some longer running distributed process to finish up into the cloud and to read that, relay that information back to us on-prem to our gateway for further decision making. So I think there's a great opportunity here um, for integration. Um, this is who I am, Bill Berry. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter or GitHub at William Berry III. I blog relatively extensively, particularly in the areas of IoT. Um, for those of you that are interested, that is actually me welding. So, uh, you know, that's what I used to do back in the day um, before I got into software. Um, and I will bring up really quick the IoT Gateway SDK um, homepage. Here, this is the GitHub repository. Um, you'll see a bunch of, oh, of course it's not duplicating now. SDK page. Um, you'll see a bunch of really great information about architectural drawings, sort of fundamentals around how to get started with the Gateway SDK, uh, the baked in modules that we have, the Bluetooth LE, a simple hello world, identity mapping, again that IoT hub and the logging modules, something for Azure Functions, um, our featured modules from the community, like I said Modbus, our OPC UA client, as well as a GZIP compression module, um, and then sort of Standing operating system compatibility, and these are basically environments that we're building and deploying against to check to make sure that we've got full operational capacity. And that includes things like Wind River, right? Which I think should be particularly interesting to this crowd. You know, if you're working in the RTOS space, um, you know, that's kind of a, a, a cool add on. Um, hardware compatibility, docs, samples, et cetera. Um, so, with that, I'll hand you all back a few minutes for your day. Um, I really appreciate your time coming out and uh, hearing about the Azure Gateway SDK. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Ah, questions, yes. Of course. How can I forget? And like I said, I've got freebies. I said that at the beginning too, so. All right, who's first? Go for it. Yep. You demonstrated to us how sometimes going to the cloud is really, really slow. Yep. And yet another reason why you might want to have some compute in the middle. Um, but then, you, if I call your, your, your SDK client, if you will, mm -hmm. the part that's in Azure, uh, in the cloud, you say that that's the server. I know you want to correct that. But 
basically you have a, an open source client and you have no open source server. So typically if I wanted to implement something in the middle, I would want to have some of that open, I would want the some server part to be able to be moved out of the cloud into the edge. Yet you provide nothing uh, for us in that regard. Will you open source some of the server piece so that people can build a better game? Sure, okay, so great question. The question was basically around, will we be open sourcing something on the cloud side for gateway functionality to connect to? And I think this is where things get relatively particular, right? If you are looking to operate you know, infrastructure as a service in the cloud, right? So you're operating your own VMs and your own servers, right? There is fundamentally no reason you cannot add an endpoint to those systems that is you know, mirrored with a client on the client side. So what protocol would you want to be speaking between your on-prem installation and your IaaS services that are in the cloud? Right? Potentially an open protocol, I would assume. You know, it could be HTTP. Um, let's go with that. Right, so let's go with that. So we're talking you know, on-prem you know, HTTP client to server in the cloud. Right? And that's fundamentally what we're hoping to get you know, sort of contributions around from the community. Without having anything on the edge, basically, it's, it's, you only have half the solution that's open source. Is what I'm trying to tell you, and it's kind of weird. well. Okay, so what you really have is a gateway solution on-prem that is open source. How you fundamentally use that, like what cloud you connect to, is basically up to you. You know, we provide out-of-the-box functionality that allows you to connect that, um, that gateway installation to Azure, but you can write modules that would do whatever you want, right? They just drop into the data processing pipeline. I'll give you an example. So let's say you want to de-risk your solution by trying out the gateway on-premises, right, without actually doing any cloud connectivity. You could really just stop the gateway SDK at the logger, push down to local files, and work off of that sort of interface in, in a more SCADA-style system, right, where everything is going to be constrained within your operational environment, and test out and run the gateway before you're ready to make the move you know, to shipping the data to a public cloud whatever public cloud that may end up being. So, you know, the add-ons for us around the, the Gateway SDK are in particular tying into our PaaS services, right? Which, you know, is IoT Hub, and that's gonna come with things like device management and those add-on services above and beyond sort of just raw data ingestion. Okay, so the IoT Hub Writer module that we support out of the box to send data to Azure supports AMQP, uh, supports MQTT, and supports HTTPS. Um, so those are your, your sort of out of the box, your three protocols that we'll be interacting with the IoT Hub Pass service with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 509, X509 um, certificates. It's up to you to implement, correct, or whatever protocol that you're using, however that protocol handles security or data encryption and so on. So how do you handle the certificate management? Uh, between the device gateway and the cloud? The device in the cloud, if, it, if, it's, if it's a direct connect or you're going to be going up to the gateway, how do you manage to make sure that if I'm going to use the internal, internally signed certified by my corporation and I'm doing a SCADA system, for example, I don't necessarily want to use publicly trusted certs, so I want to use my own certs. So uh, just a real quick question, why would you not want to use certs that were uh, signed by a public authority? They're signed by a public authority, but they're not necessarily going to be the, the same certificates that are signed and loaded into say, a browser. Okay, so... I want to be able to have some level that if I can revoke a cert, yep. I want to be able to just revoke it and not have to go through and get a massive re-signing ceremony done to manage that certificate base that I put out that I don't want to necessarily have a public-facing cert. Sure. So your, uh, that is a, uh, the, sorry, just to repeat the question, it was around um, using privately, well, publicly signed, but private certs uh, for device management situations. And um, I can get some information to you after this on that. Um, sorry, I can't answer that right off the top of my head for you. Yeah. Oh, great. Why choose the 
Azure or over Helix Device Cloud? So the question was, uh, why choose Azure over Helix Device Cloud? And I actually can't speak to that. I have no experience with the Wind River products, unfortunately. Um, so, sorry about that. Oh, hold on one sec. Uh, in terms of size, memory allocation, that kind of stuff, I don't have those statistics um, for you, but but it's relatively small. So the question was, does the gateway support other clouds? And uh, taking my Microsoft hat off, Fundamentally, and, and we kind of touched on this earlier, you can write you know, a module at the end of the pipeline to do whatever you want, right? So if you want it to consume some REST API that you've deployed to, say, a service fabric cluster or to some IaaS somewhere or even to your own data center, um, that's perfectly within scope and capability of the gateway itself, right? Because we're just, what we're trying to provide to you is this sort of core baseline infrastructure around message brokers and a message, or sort of a data pipeline between ingestion to exit. So then do you think you would accept drivers for other clouds upstream? So the question is, do we think we would accept drivers for the clouds upstream? And that's a great question. I don't know. And frankly, uh, I would think that the team would, yeah. Um, in fact, that would probably be something I'd be willing to push personally. You know, was to write modules around that. So, you know, I think we have a really great story around device management and that kind of stuff for Azure. But you know, there are compelling stories all over the place. So, yeah, if you're trying to make an open framework for problems, one would presuppose. Yes. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes. Okay, so how do we compare our solution to Eclipse Cura? Um, I don't have any uh, personal experience with Cura, so I don't know. Um, I just started playing with it last week uh, to try and get a feel around it. Um, so uh, I wish I could answer that personally, but I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> Yeah, so everything that's, uh, the question was, you know, is everything that's in the box, you know, allow you to connect to Azure and sort of get started? And the answer is yes. Um, the Hello World samples will get you up and running, sending data to Azure. Um, you can get started with a free account um, at, you know, I think it's portal.azure.com will allow you to get started with a free account for Azure with a certain number of credits um, and begin exploring. IoT Hub, um, so I use IoT Hub personally for my own home automation system. I use the free tier. Um, it's good for 8,000 messages a day, which is more than my children can turn the lights on and off in a light switch rave at home. Um, so, you know, it serves my purposes pretty well, and, it, and it's totally free. So I do pay a limited amount for storage down to DocDB um, to keep that data. But any other questions? Yeah. Can I make a request for a change to the code? Uh, sure. Have you filed an issue on the, the GitHub repository? Okay, yeah, I would, uh, so the question was whether or not we could have uh, some functions return real error codes. And I would really encourage you to file an issue on GitHub. Um, we are actively monitoring it, right? The code development for the SDK is done out in the open. Um, you know, I file issues with the team all the time. You know, and that's, that's my channel of communication to them is through GitHub issues. And part of that's about trying to encode some of this knowledge basically in the GitHub issues for people to be able to search and, and, and you know, find down the road. So it's an important form of documentation for us as well. One more comment? Yeah. Uh, you made a comment that it takes 20 minutes to file every time you do something. Yes. Yes, we are currently using CMake, and uh, I don't know if there have been any requests to the team to use um, another build platform. Um, yeah. 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 Unfortunately, I you know obviously can't speak to the build system. Um, I'm just a user. Yeah, no, totally. Totally. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. What are the fundamental data rate constraints of this gateway? Let's say I want to push 
Well, I have a real world problem. I work with a customer who uses vibration data from a machine array, and we send that data up in small chunks, but then they suddenly say, look, I really want to look at 30 kilohertz data because that's my Fourier transform showed me that's where the problem is. Is would that be a possibility with this gateway, or is the messaging system too slow to handle burst of high-speed data? So the question was around whether or not the SDK is capable of handling like high bursts of data. Um, the pipeline, the data pipeline coming in and out of every module is serial, right? So those messages are going to stack up in the queue and be processed as fast as your code will run. Um, you know, I would think in that particular type of scenario, you would want to be doing, you know, some sort of pre-processing on your data at your device level. Um, but I don't know enough about your application to really answer that. Um, I've not tried uh, to push the SDK really, really, really hard. Um, you know, I've gone down to, I think, 10 millisecond cycles, and it was just fine streaming data up to Azure um, on sort of that speed. Um, but, yeah, I don't have that answer for you off the top of my head. So. so the comment in the back was that MQTT is obviously faster than REST and AMQP. Um, yeah. yeah, the AMQP stuff, the connectivity is super robust. Once the channel is stood up, it's amazing. Um, but it does take a while to negotiate that handshake and get that connection stood up um, properly. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, great discussion, good questions. Um, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks. Thank you.